Star Wars fan and even those who have always been intrigued by if there's life somewhere else in the universe, if there is one more Earth like ours, if there's any other life form in the universe. This episode is especially for you. What if I tell you that whenever you look up in the sky and you see stars, each star has its own sun and each sun has its own planet. That is the insane amount of planets that we are talking about. So can there be a possibility that there exists a life somewhere on one of these planets, one of these thousands of planets that we are talking about? Watch this whole episode to figure this out. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to the 13th episode of Step Up with Natasha. And tonight's the guest that I have, she is an astronomer, she is a planetary scientist, and she's known for her work uh, you know, on exploring life in the universe. And if I may say so, NASA fondly refers to her as Astronomical Indiana Jones. And I'm really excited to have her. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Sarah Seeger. Hey Sarah, hi, how are you? What's up? How are things? Hi Natasha, hello Natasha, great. Everything's great, how are you? I'm good too, and I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, when the first time I came across your TED talk, I was like, you know, this is something that we all have been obsessing about since our childhood, I think ever since we all watched Star Wars. And we were like, you know, this is something that really needs to be in the show. And I'm so grateful to you for actually accepting my request and be a part of this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay, so for starters, one thing that I really want to ask is that how much did Captain Spock from Star Wars actually got it right when it comes to exploring life, you know, elsewhere oh, in the universe? Yes, yes. Well, I love to say that sometimes science fiction got it totally wrong. It yeah. turns out, remember in the Star Trek how the Enterprise has to travel very fast to huge distances? So that Spock, you know, they can orbit a planet and Spock can look at it. Yes. Well, in fact, it turns out that if you were to make a movie of me or of us today, it would be incredibly boring because we just use our telescopes here yeah. on Earth. Yeah. You know, we use Hubble and we study the stars to search for planets. So we don't go there. Right. And we also don't know yet how right or wrong Star Trek was because we're still kind of in the baby stages of exploring other planets. Right. So, yeah. uh, for, uh, you know, I really want this to be broken down to such minutest and simple details that even a layman can understand. So, I came right, across right. a sample exoplanets in your TED talk. I really wanted to understand what exactly is an exoplanet and how different is it, I mean, uh, from a planet? Like, what is the basic difference between that? Right. Well, an exoplanet is a planet, and it's a planet that orbits a star other than the sun. Okay. Now, tonight, I would be great if everyone can step outside. And even if you're in the most busiest city, you usually can see at least like two, three, four stars, like look up there. Because Natasha, each of those stars is a sun. Yeah. And it's hard to conceive of that because they're just a pinprick of light, right? Yeah, yeah. They're each a sun. And we have evidence that each sun out there has planets just like our sun does. Yeah. Our sun has a solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, etc. And we're getting evidence that all the other stars appear to have planets also. <laughs> so an exoplanet is a planet orbiting another star, another sun. Okay. So if I may get it, if I get it right, it's that, you know, every star has its own sun and every sun has its own planet. And that's the reason we can uh, almost not conclude, but at least assume because then there'll be so many suns and so many planets mm -hmm. out there that would that there might be a possibility that we have life somewhere there, right? That's exactly the thought. Yes. Okay. And I, and was, yeah, yeah, and I love your reference to Star Wars and Star Trek and because that's what we've been wondering forever. For thousands of years, people have been looking at the sky and just wondering what is out there. Was that your actually uh, the interest point that piqued your interest like while growing up in it that this is what I want to do when you watch any of that series? Yeah, like not exactly. No, no. no. In fact, did you, I don't know if you ever saw the original Star Trek. Uh, the, the older uh, one. The oldest one, yeah, yeah. No, 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 not, not that one. When I was uh, a child, it was on reruns. Okay. And in those days, we didn't have too many channels, and everyone only had one TV. It's not like you had your phone and could stream. Yeah. I just remember being a little annoyed with the show, to be honest, because it was very slow moving, and I wanted to watch something else. But we had to kind of, my older brother always got to decide, so. <laughs> okay, okay. So, in fact, what you uh, right now spoke about, that also uh, somewhere led me to not conclude, but because... You know, when we are, talk about our solar system, when we have this, when we talk about our sun, it's really huge, it's big, you can see it, you know. And when we talk about that every star has a sun, of course, 
we are not able to see them. That's the reason it becomes a little. It's like how is it even possible? You know, it's not even visible from naked eye. How how is it possible? Yeah. So are all these exoplanets, or how many ever uh, exoplanets we've been able to come across and find out, are they in the purview of our solar system, or are they really far away from that? They're very. Well, could you explain your question a little more? Okay, so uh, because I came across this, uh, you know, that this point in your talk where you said that you know it might take forty or seventy thousand years to reach. I think we were talking about Alpha Centauri, if I'm not wrong. Right. 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 Yeah. So you said it might take uh, to even uh, start the process and even understand whether there's some there's a possibility out there. So that right. that's what led me to thinking that. Today, when we are trying to discover life on Mars, I'm sure that it's not that far mm -hmm. because, I mean, it is, right. but not that it will take 40,000 years, right? Yes, that yes. Made, that led me to think yeah. that maybe all these exoplanets are really far from our solar system. Very it's not far. within our purview, and that is the reason it becomes very difficult for to access that kind of information. That's exactly right. Because unlike Star Trek and Star Wars, we have no way of going there. And as to Mars, when the time comes, hopefully soon, that humans can go to Mars, it's about a six month journey. Yeah. So you have to get in that spacecraft and like hunker down for six months. But the other stars are literally many trillions of miles away. Dozens of trillions, hundreds of trillions of miles. And we have no way right now for us humans to even conceive of going there. So unfortunately, yeah, it's not like Star Trek, Star Wars. We do have very little information because we can't go there. Right. But, but that's, well, that's okay, because in astronomy, yeah. We study objects very far away, yeah. and so we use our telescopes like Hubble and other Hubble things, yeah. Yeah. and we're kind of waiting for our next generation of telescopes to okay. make more progress in understanding what these kinds of planets actually are. Okay, but what is your take on Mars, like when people are really investing in it, and because I, so uh, in my 10th episode, I had the, uh, you know, I had the pleasure to interact with uh, uh, one of the astrobiologists who's looking out for life on Mars while uh, studying right. Atacama Desert. So I had a, this whole conversation with him regarding life on Mars. And in fact, I'm really curious to ask you as well, that what do you think? Uh, because whatever we have studied so far, whatever discoveries have been made, uh, it's still, it's, it's, you know, we have not reached to that point where we can really say that, yes, life is possible here. In fact, if I may remember, I don't know. I mean, I'm a complete layman. I just watched it, and that's the reason I wanted to confirm it with you. That uh, you know, they say that if even if it happens, then everything has to be set up there artificially, right? Right. It, like, just not the human civilization, but everything would have to be manually set up there. So, with that kind of investment and risk and everything, uh, what? How do you see? Uh, human civilization actually going to Mars and, uh, you know, make that their habitat. Well, you've painted a very good picture for us already, Natasha. It's going to be a really <laughs> tough life there. <laughs> and, you know, we're just so fragile as humans. Like, I personally have never climbed Mount Everest or Kilimanjaro, obviously. But you know how people climb Mount Everest? They run out of air. Because yeah. we are so sensitive to even the amount of oxygen we need. And Mars is incredibly foreign. It literally has no air as we know it. It has only like mostly carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so we couldn't breathe there. Walking would be fun because there's a lot less gravity on Mars. Mm -hmm. And so, right, we'd have to set everything up. Just like the movie The Martian. Have you, yes. have you seen The Martian? Yes, just I've just seen yeah, wow. yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, how, how many uh, such exoplanets have we been able to come across so far that we really feel? And what exactly is the process? Because I'm sure that you would be covering those, that's the insane amount of stars and suns and planets we are talking about. And I'm sure it's not possible for uh, you people to actually go through each and every. So what's the process like? Like, how do you qualify that, you know? Because I do remember you talking about Goldilocks, I, I believe. You know, just the right, right kind of uh, atmospheric pressure to make life right. happen there, right? So what is the process? How do you qualify that? Well, first of all, I just want you to know that we know about thousands of planets, around 5,000 planets orbiting stars, pretty okay. nearby stars. Okay. But that doesn't mean there aren't way more, because we think every star has planets. And our galaxy alone has hundreds of billions of stars. Wow. So that's like trillions of planets out there. But right now we know of a few thousand, we, thousands. We have thousands more that are 
we call them planet candidates. We're just waiting to verify that they're actually planets and not just a false signal. So that's one thing. Secondly, I want you to know that so far, we don't know of any planets like Earth. We know of some planets that are the same size of, as Earth or the same mass, or they might receive the same energy from their star that we do. But you know, these stars are just points of light and we usually don't see the planet at all. So we know little about them. In fact, what we see more of are giant planets um, or Neptune-sized planets or planets two to three times the size of Earth, planets that are too big and hot to host life. Okay. So just so you know, most of those planets are pretty crazy. And if it makes you feel any better because the universe is so mysterious, yeah we actually haven't found any solar system copies yet. All the planetary systems out there are very different from ours, from our solar system, yeah. So I just wanted like to lay that as the background. Right. Yeah. Okay, so when we say that, that you know, uh, all the other planetary systems can be really different from what we have. So we can also, uh, there can be a possibility, there can be a scope that then the form of life can also be pretty different. It cannot be the same, I mean, like for Earth, we can say that, you know, what is really important to survive, right? Like what is one of the more, most significant, uh, uh, you know, with that resource that we need over here. Uh, what exactly do we look out for when we talk about having a possibility of life somewhere else? Is it the right sort of atmospheric pressure? Do we look out for water? What exactly is it? Well, we, the first thing we're looking for is, yes, water, the right temperature for a planet to host water. All life as we know it, here at least, needs water. Exactly. And we're sure that life elsewhere needs some kind of liquid so that molecules can react. Molecules okay. can break down and form new molecules just so that life can originate and life has something to work with. Water's the most abundant liquid out there. To have water, we need the right temperature. That's where the so-called Goldilocks zone or Goldilocks planet comes in. That's why we say, like the story of Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold but just right for life. Just right for life. So it, can, right. it, would, it would somewhere lie in the middle of the whole planetary system, if I'm not wrong. Something like that. I mean, we call the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. It's the zone around the star so that a planet orbiting um, as heated by the star mm -hmm. is estimated to have the right temperature for life. Okay. But that's and just an estimate. We don't have a way to measure the temperature. We right. don't have a way to uh, assess like the greenhouse gases on the planet, not yet. And how, how uh, far are we from there? Like how much more time are we going to take? What, what do you think? How much more years or I don't know decades would it take for us to actually reach out there? Because I still remember you said that even if we figured out that there is life there, there's no point because it would take us forever to reach there, right? Right. Well, this is like a multi-generational or like thousands of years kind of endeavor. But our first chance to study atmospheres to look for signs of life will hopefully come in a year or two when the next generation Hubble Space Telescope, it's called the James Webb Space Telescope. We call it Webb for short. Okay. Webb okay. will be launched, uh, should be launched at the end of 2021. And it will travel very far from Earth where it will orbit. Mm -hmm. And it will study planets, study atmospheres of small rocky planets. Now it can't look at a million planets or even a thousand. Probably there's going to be about a half dozen like really good planet candidates that are rocky and in their habitable zone, Goldilocks zone. And those are the ones that the whole astronomy community is going to try very hard to tell if they have liquid water to look for signs of life on them. That's the first step, okay. the first kind of step in this multi-generational search. Okay. But even if that happens, like you said, that because the distance is so much that it would take forever to reach there. So, I mean, yes, I think now I get it when you say that it's a very multi-generational thing that even I guess you would start right now, but for the whole process to culminate into something, it's going to take a lot of time. Right? Oh, well, it will take a lot of time. Now, the thing about exoplanets that's so great is we do use our imaginations, just like Star Trek and Star Wars. Okay. We love to imagine what these worlds are like. And we have this phrase in exoplanets, I just wanted to share it with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I love to say that the line between what is mainstream science that we can do for, for real to have a job at and what is considered completely crazy and out there, that line is constantly shifting. So 25, 30 years ago, if someone said they were 
seriously looking for life on another planet, they would just be like laughed out of the room. Honestly, it would have been so far-fetched because we didn't have the tools to do it. Mm. And just the thought that that could be an actual real job would be insane. So today, believe it or not, uh, well, you know that, or you wouldn't be interviewing me if exoplanets and the search for life weren't a real job. <laughs> and now what's on the side of crazy is the thought of going to another planetary system. Yes. But there are people working on that, actually. Not that you and I could travel, but that little tiny spacecraft could get accelerated and travel to the nearest star. And it would take a very long time. First of all, it will take a long, maybe 10, 20, 30 years to get the technology to work. And then it would take, it would be a 20 year journey for these little tiny spacecraft to reach the nearest star. And they would snap a photo as they're zooming by the star at incredible speeds. And they would send the photos back here to earth, back to us. And even that journey for the photos to get back to earth would take a few years. So just, you know, it's not, like it's still a pretty crazy idea. But in this field, we, we dream of big things. And then it's kind of crazy or it's science fiction. And then someone comes along who tries to make it real and might fail a few times, but it plants the seed for big things to really happen. Right. And so when you look out for, because I think people uh, have this notion, and I'm talking about like, you know, common people like me, when you talk about finding life somewhere else, people generally assume that, you know, we are literally looking at like a human form of life or, you know, even when you talk about aliens, we look at very much in the space of the way we have seen ET or maybe more of human form, that sort of intelligence. But when we talk about life, I think we're really talking about even the microbes, right, which is, which is also mm -hmm. a living. So what's, what is your idea of life when you when you say that you know you look up for life somewhere in the universe right so the thing about talking to a scientist is we like to be very precise with our language so i would say we're searching for signs of life on another planet and when we find these signs of life we literally won't know if it's coming from a little green humanoid the alien we all love to picture or if it's just coming from bacteria like slime, you know, if something goes bad in your fridge, it goes moldy and you open your fridge and it smells terrible. Have you had that? That's nasty. That's what we might be finding is life that's giving off a gas that smells terrible, but that's what we're going to do. So what we're looking for, we can look at atmospheres of planets and look for gases in the atmosphere. And we're already able to do that for giant planets, planets that won't host life, but giant exoplanets. And we're working on looking at smaller and smaller rocky planets in the habitable zones of their stars. The best example we give you is oxygen. Mm. Right on our planet, we all need oxygen to breathe, all of us humans anyway, and animals. Right. But did you know that if we didn't have life on our planet, if we didn't have plants and photosynthetic bacteria, we would have virtually zero oxygen. So if there are intelligent beings on a planet orbiting a nearby star with the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build, and they're looking back at Earth and looking at the gases in our atmosphere and they see oxygen, they'll know that oxygen is incredibly reactive and they'll know it shouldn't be in the atmosphere. And they might be able to piece together that there's an excellent chance that there is life on Earth making that oxygen. So our study isn't like an image of a little green alien waving to us. It's not even of the slime mold covering a planet. It's really just looking for gases that don't belong. And that is our search for, for signs of life. Right. And I'm sure that it would be a very, because uh, when you, because you, like you already said that, you know, the other planetary systems can be really different. So you are really exploring n number of permutations and combinations of, uh, you know, the gases and atmospheric pressure and whatnot. I mean, there's, there's no one right way to look at it because we are just not talking about our planetary system. So I'm sure right. that it just, like the whole work amplifies, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, and you don't even know what might not work for us might be working for some other system where when we might be rejecting it. It's like, you know, it doesn't work like that, but maybe the life form has adapted itself there like that, right? Right, exactly. That's a gigantic thing to do. I'm, no, I'm, you've done a great job, Natasha, because even very few scientists capture it so perfectly. Thank you so much. The unknowns are just so huge. And all the combinations that could be possible are just something we can barely can get our heads around. 
I'm sure. So <laughs> because, uh, like you said, that you know, uh, we didn't had the resources and the sort of technology to actually look out for it even until recently. So I'm sure that the whole process. I mean, the curiosity has always been there. To that, you know, this question has always been there: Are we alone in the universe or not? But now, since we are, I would say that we are at least at certain level. Uh, what I really want to know that in this this period of time, what has been the biggest breakthrough for you know you and for the whole uh, uh, the astronomer community and all the planetary scientists? What has been the biggest breakthrough that you know you can say that in such a short span of time? And we've been really when I'm and I'm specifically talking about uh, trying to figure out life, signs of life elsewhere in the universe. According to you, what would be the biggest discovery or breakthrough or idea? Uh, that has changed the way uh, you are making your discoveries? There have been so many big milestones. I mean, most of them have to do with technology. The same reason why you can have, everyone can have, a, the same reason why everyone who can afford one has a smartphone. And that smartphone is so capable. It's way more capable than anything. Your camera on your phone is incredible. Right. So one of the big milestones was just detectors becoming so sensitive. Like in the olden days, when they were thinking about Hubble, they wanted to send up photographic plates, <laughs> like actual, like almost like film cameras, right. because electronic detectors had just been developed. Mm -hmm. And so having the detectors increase in sensitivity is one of the main things that has allowed us to find planets. Okay. Secondly, it's software. Again, the same reason why you can have your small phone and everything else GPS, it's because software um, and computer speeds have increased so much we can analyze a lot of data at one time yeah, so those yeah. are two of the main reasons okay. we okay. also and i myself got to invent like key methods to find planets and study their atmospheres and so all of those things um have led us to here yeah. in fact i was uh, going to this one of your talks somewhere and you said that there's this NASA software called uh, Eye on the, I'm forgetting the name, Eye on the Planet. Eyes on Exoplanet. Eyes on, the, eyes on the Exoplanet. And the way you were actually maneuvering through the whole thing, the map and everything, I was like, wow. especially when you zoomed into the, uh, to locate where exactly the sun was, it, I, I was just mind blown by, at that point of time, I was like, wow. I mean, this is what we are exactly trying to delve into and look into. And it's, Really, I mean, now I really understand that why we call it space. It's really vast. It's really vast when we talk about yes, it. Yes, and it, the software is called Eyes on Exoplanets, and anyone can download it to your computer or your phone. It's made by NASA. It's incredible because you can see a real map of the stars, and it helps you understand which stars have planets. And you can literally click on that star on the map, and it zooms in and tells you what kind of planets are around that specific star. Right. So yes. if, there's, if there's one thing, uh, because I know that, you know, uh, there's an expertise that goes into what you do and there comes along with a lot of, uh, you know, education and a lot of understanding for that. But if there's one thing that you would want the whole community to understand or support you in, what would that be? Because this is an interesting subject. It has already been made popular by the kind of movies we have watched. But to make it so simple to uh, to be able to be understood by everyone on this planet what is that one thing that you would really like to tell people i'd like people to let me think for a second about that one <laughs> sure i'd like people to know that there are so many stars and so many planets out there our focus right now is on the nearest stars, and we really want to find a planet just like Earth. We want to find signs of life on another planet, not because we can go there today, but we just want to know that we're not alone. We want to know that there's some more meaning in our universe, other than us, like, stuck here on our lonely planet. That would, how, 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 what's the timeline that you're looking at that, uh, you think that, you know, we might be able to crack that one day when we can say that, you know, that is, that is another world. Well, there's, in the search for bio, these so-called gases that don't belong, signs of life on another planet, I expect that in our generation, my generation, we will see signs of life on another planet. You know, it may not be enough for us to jump up and down and go, yay, we found it, we're done. It's honestly probably just the first step 
and then a next generation of astronomers and telescopes will help confirm it. And later downstream, we may find a way to send a probe there to get a better look. So we so, might be just laying the building block for them. Yes, and it's kind of hard to understand. It's kind of depressing when we're so close yet so far, but it takes time, partly because it's not our priority as a society and we don't funnel huge amounts of money into it. And it also, each new telescope becomes more and more sophisticated and expensive and takes longer to build. So we do have this, uh, have to have a bit of patience and make sure we encourage the next generation to carry the torch. In fact, on that note, I would really like to ask you that what keeps you going? Like when, when, especially when someone knows that, you know, whatever work I'm doing right now, that will take like multi-generational to actually turn it into reality and still have the drive and have that, you know, let's keep going on factor. What really keeps, keeps you going to keep looking out for that? Well, initially when I was younger, I was convinced that we were going to find the first Earth-like planets and signs of life on them. And I never, ever thought that it wouldn't happen for sure. And so now as I got older, I'm already entrenched in it. And I start to realize that it's way harder than a young person thought, and it will take longer. But honestly, what keeps me going is I just love my work. That's, you know, the best advice I have for everybody is find something you love doing that you're also good at. And I love computer programming. I love solving problems. And so it's like that day to day, like discovering something new in your computer code that you've applied to data. And just sort of thinking about all these gases, it actually led me down a different path to a new field of science. And just the sort of, I wish I could convey to you and everybody that in the best case science, it's a journey of exploration. It's as if we're like the first person to go to the North Pole. <laughs> and but it's in um, a weird space inside our head and inside yeah. our computer and inside our laboratories so sort of the joy of discovery and the small steps along the way that also uh, keep me going not just the eye of the final final prize you love the process more than i'm sure that you love the fruit as well but you love the process as well i think i love the process as well yeah. i mean the fruit is the best part but yeah. you have to love the process, the process. Or you'll never be able to stay the course I think especially going into the unknown when, where you know whatever you come across is still new and it's still a fruit because no one knows about it yet, right? So I think that is also something that can really keep you excited. So tell me one thing, what, what uh, how else people can get to know more about it? Have you been writing a book? Are you, uh, are you giving talk somewhere else? How can, how can people get to know more about it? Sure. Well, actually, I did write a book Perfect. and I'm going to just change my background screen so sure. I can tell you a little bit about the book. Sure. The smallest so life my, in the universe. Yes, my book is called The Smallest Life in the Universe. And this book is a journey. It describes my personal journey exploring outer space, but also exploring inner space. It starts with outer space, like the number of stars out there. There's billions of stars and in the night sky, we just see so many stars. The possibilities out there are just tremendous. They're huge and they are wondrous. But at the same time, life can change in the blink of an eye. We all saw that with coronavirus. Kind of was like not really a thing. It was far close and then everything just shut down and we're still suffering. And in my book, it describes my own personal health tragedy, not with coronavirus, but with a death in my family. And then the whole story uh, weaves together the sort of journey from the depths of despair and the journey of this incredibly challenging search for another earth. And in the end, uh, the story is about the search for meaning and the search for togetherness, something we all share. So, some, so basically, you know, what you were looking, what you're seeking outside is also is what you have all within you. Right? Yeah, yes. That's, okay. that's what it's about. Especially coming from an astronomer, it makes even more sense, I believe. Great. So where all people can find you, if someone wants to reach out to you, wants to see more of your content, where, how can they connect with you? Where can they reach out to you? Oops. They can find me on, they can browse my website, sarahseeger.com. They can find me on Facebook. They can find me on Twitter, at Prof. Sarah Seeger. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Professor. This has been 
quite an enlightening uh, and space exploration exploratory session for me and i had uh, i have always been very curious when in fact i think i can safely say for everyone i will we always every time been curious about space and what goes there now we are alone in that so uh, speaking to you you really answered a lot of my questions and i'm sure that people would really enjoy this conversation whenever they watch so thank you so much i had a really good time and i hope and i i really try to do justice to it but i really hope that you had a good time over here you did a great job natasha it was very good talking to you thank you so much thank you and hopefully we'll connect again and hopefully you know, this can be made into a season 2 as well and i really i really hope and pray that by the time we connect again you know that might be you might find that building block which can lay the foundation for the next generation of astronomers to build a building on thanks natasha thank you thank you thank you so much take care bye bye